The gospel reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. And Jesus says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all. Stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so I came to faith in the year 2000. I was 17 years old. It was right before my senior year of high school. Uh, and at the time, one of the most popular books people in the church were reading at that time was the Left Behind series. I don't know if you're familiar with that, if you remember it. It came out in 1999. I looked it up this past week. It was co-authored by uh, two guys by the name of Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins were their names. Um, what it was, it was this relatively extensive series, 16 books total, $200 on Amazon right now. Merry Christmas. That's a, good, like, a nice little gift, huh? The whole set. Uh, but no, it was uh, 16 books all about the end of the world. Uh, and I guess in one sense, it was fictional insofar as none of it has ever really happened. And I think the authors would contend it's based on a true story. Uh, and what they mean by that, uh, it's based on a biblical belief, that is, that the world we live in right now will, in fact, someday come to an end. Uh, which, by the way, is not just uh, ancient scripture, it's also modern physics, for what, the, for what it's worth. Uh, you see, I never read those books, that's not really my cup of tea in terms of fiction. Uh, but what I did read, and this would have been my freshman year of college, so I'm like a new believer, just kind of finding my way in the faith. Uh, and the same authors of Left Behind wrote a non-fictional book called, the title, are We Living in the End Times? Uh, and I feel like the title was meant to be rhetorical. Uh, if only because the whole book seemed to be written as the author's foregone conclusion. Well, duh! Of course we're living in the end times, was kind of the assumption. And so what the book does is it just points out all the different things that were happening like 20, 30 years ago that the authors would say coincide with biblical prophecy concerning the end of the age. And so, at least in my particular circle of Christianity back then, people were convinced, this is it. The end is near, right? Uh, so just a little over 10 years ago, 2011 is when this would have happened, I was doing my pastoral internship up on the central coast. I was living in Pismo Beach at the time, and I remember starting around February 2011, literally every single day parked at the pier was an old beat-up truck with a sign on each side of the bed. On one side, big block letters that said, the end is near. It was very ominous. Uh, and then the other side, it had a date for the end. It was May 21st, 2011. Uh, and standing right by the truck, which is parked right at the front of the pier, is a guy handing out pamphlets to anyone within a 10-foot radius of him, and also shouting at anyone who tries to get outside that 10-foot radius, um, including one day myself, right, to whom he said, as I tried to avoid him like the plague, that I was, quote, in the gall of bitterness, 
is what he shouted at me. What does that mean? I think it's biblical. I don't know. Uh, But no, it seems like an uncharitable interpretation to me. Maybe I'm just kind of an introvert and you look a little weird. Or maybe it's also because it appears you haven't showered in a month. I'm just saying. Maybe there are other reasons for my avoidance. Uh, But no, eventually, a couple weeks later, I ended up talking to this guy. I feel like I couldn't not do it, right? I'm like, oh my goodness, I gotta talk to this guy. And the thing is, I'll never forget him. His name was Thomas, which I found kind of ironic, if only because Thomas is typically doubting Thomas. Like, very skeptical, right? Uh, Whereas this brother, in my opinion, was way too gullible, like, not nearly skeptical enough. Uh, What I mean by that is he was a full-fledged follower of a Christian radio host by the name of Harold Camping. Uh, The one thing about Harold Camping, he became famous, famous, use that word loosely, uh, in 2011, uh, specifically for claiming that he had deciphered the meaning of some very obscure biblical texts. And what they were all saying is, according to him, is May 21st, 2011, it's going to be the end of the world. And you see, in talking to this Thomas, he was adamant that the prediction was correct, that he and Harold Camping and a few other people were kind of in the know. Uh, They knew when the end was going to come. And so I argued with him a little. Uh, I even pointed out at one point our gospel passage today, uh, in which Christ says, no one knows, not even Jesus. Uh, That did not go anywhere, by the way. He was convinced he still knew. And so what I decided to do is I would just wait. Wait for what, one might ask? For May 21st, (laughs) right? You see, on that day, I made it a point to march down to the pier. And when I got down there, what do you think? He wasn't there. (laughs) Maybe he got raptured, which means, oh crap, I got left behind. Like, ah! (laughs) Uh, Or another option, maybe Harold Camping got it wrong, just saying. Uh, And in fact, Harold Camping came on the radio a few days later and he said, I got it wrong. He admitted it. I got it wrong. Uh, Everyone wished he'd just kind of stopped there and just been quiet. But he actually said, no, I got it wrong, but I merely miscalculated. The real date is six months from now. October 21st, 2011. Here it comes, right? Uh, So this Thomas, uh, (laughs) he didn't even change the sign. He just crossed out May (laughs) and wrote October. Like, how much of a joke is this? Uh, And so here's the thing about this. Uh, Believe it or not, this is not anything new. It's nothing new. And what I mean is Christians in literally every era of the church, not just ours, but every era, have looked at the world around them and believed that the end is near. Uh, And for the most part, by the way, for good reason. You see, because the Bible is full of what are called apocalyptic passages, one of which is today's text. Uh, And the thing about apocalyptic passages, they almost always give a list of things that will happen right at the end. And you see, what's tricky is in every generation, those things actually happen. Natural disasters, major wars, worldwide pandemics, things kind of unraveling at the seams, almost every generation sees that. And as a result, almost every generation of believers has thought to themselves, this is the end. And guess what? Every single time, we've been totally wrong. Uh, Meaning, every time we've said, this is the end, has not time just still marched on. And so in one sense, we've been very wrong. And yet, in another sense, maybe not in the way that we mean it, by the way, but in another sense, we have been completely right. That the end is, in fact, very near. So let me try to explain that. If you go to our passage, Christ is talking about the end of the age. And in particular, he says, when you see, things, when you see these things happen, uh, meaning this kind of like tribulation all around you, which is described in relative detail in the verses immediately prior to today's reading. So this grand tribulation, uh, he says that when you see that, that he himself, Christ himself, quote, is right at the gates, is what he says. And you see, if you keep reading, he has a saying about that, about his nearness, that is. This is verse 30. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away. Meaning who? meaning the generation of people who are standing right in front of him that day. This generation, he's saying, will not pass away until all these things have taken place. 2,000 years ago, he says that. And so it seems like the end was very near back then. So they thought, 
I'm like, how is that possible 2,000 years ago, right? Did they get it wrong? Uh, But then notice this. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, meaning there's still going to be generations that come after this. They're going to come and they're going to pass away, but then he says, but my words will not pass away. It's like cryptic, right? Uh, It's as if to say, my words will remain valid in every generation. Meaning, in other words, the end is very near. Or you could say Christ himself is very near to every generation. And you see, if you read the early church thinkers on this, like St. Augustine, what they'll argue is what this is saying, uh, is from the moment that Christ came, every generation has been living in the end times. And in particular, they point out a couple things. And Hang with me, okay? It's going to be like... Um, but they point out a couple of things. One is if we pay attention to what happened at the crucifixion, uh, all the prophecies about the end of the age that have pointed to the end, uh, the sun being darkened, an earthquake happening, the dead being raised, the heavens being shaken, all of that happened at the death of Christ. And so that was the end, one might say. The beginning of the end is what they said. It broke into the story right in the middle. Uh, Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean there won't be an end end. It's just that that end is near to us in every age. And so you see, the thing about this, like, how is that possible? How is the end near to us in every age? Uh, They would say when apocalyptic passages speak of the nearness of the Lord, or of the second coming of Christ, or the closeness of God's kingdom, it's not necessarily speaking of chronological closeness. It tends to be how we interpret it, uh, which leads to all sorts of troubles about predicting dates and things like that. Uh, But instead, what it's getting at is what some have referred to as spiritual closeness. Or maybe the more philosophical term they use is they talk about metaphysical closeness. Or perhaps my favorite way to put it, uh, they would put put it this way in kind of like medieval monasteries, they would talk about mystical closeness. Whatever way you want to put it, what it's getting at is there's a very thin veil between time and eternity. There's a very porous gate between this creation and its creator, and that that gate is actually Christ himself on the cross. That's the gate. He calls himself the gate. That's the end, the capital E end. And that Christ is just as close to us, not chronologically, but mystically. He is just as close to us now as he was back then. Which that's all kind of more philosophical stuff, uh, but the point is this. The veil is thin. The Lord is near. The day is at hand, is what these texts are saying. We usually take them as predictive. We think the point is to freak us out, right? No, the point is to be prophetic. And the goal of that is to wake us up. And so you see, here's the issue that we need to reckon with, or that our passage today is trying to reckon with, with us. It's that a lot of us are not ready. That was perfect timing. (laughs) It is the Lord. (laughs) They're going to keep trying until you shut it off. There goes my serious point. Uh, The point being that a lot of us are not ready, uh, that we are in fact asleep to the Lord. What I mean by that, we are inattentive, that is, to the closeness of Christ, unconscious, that is, to the calling of Christ, unaware of what is so close to us right now. And so to paraphrase Augustine, he used to say, he had this saying, he said, God is always with us, which you hear the people in the church say all the time, like, God is always with us. But he would say, God is always with us, but we are not always with God. So to put it in the words of our reading today, you could say that Christ is very close to you right now. Maybe it is him. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> you should answer. I can bring it up here. Uh, But Christ is very close to us right now. (laughs) This is not landing exactly how I wanted. (laughs) Uh, But Christ is very close to us right now. Uh, The issue being, uh, a lot of us right now are not very close to Christ. Right? 
In other words, another way to put it, a lot of us are essentially sleepwalking through our life. And so the question that I want to look at for the rest of this is, how do we wake up? How do we wake up to the presence of the Lord? He's so close to us. How do we actually attend to that and become awake to that? Uh, Stay awake is what Christ says to us in this passage. Uh, So we're just going to look today at how to do that. Uh, It's going to be a two-part teaching. We're going to stick with this passage for two consecutive weeks, half today, half next week. Uh, But what the two parts are, if I can mention them both, and then we'll just jump into the first. Uh, Today it's going to be, how do we end up asleep in the first place? I think my kind of my assumption built into that question is, it does not just come out of nowhere. Instead, there's often kind of a pattern or a process, which a lot of the times is actually predictable in terms of how we end up asleep to God. And so what is that process, or how does that happen that we fall asleep? Uh, And then next week, what we'll look at is, how do we wake up, is the question. Uh, And for that, I want to look at a few specific practices that Christians have long engaged in in order to kind of like cultivate wakefulness to God. Uh, So those two things. Let's go to today's, which is, how do we end up, even though Christ is very close to us, like, right now, how do we end up asleep to him? Uh, what does that process kind of look like? And I think if we were aware of it happening, we'd be able to stop it before it did happen, right? That's the goal. Uh, so in the 3rd and 4th century AD, a good number of Christians, oh wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in the 3rd and 4th century AD, a good number of Christians moved out into the desert. Uh, they like ran out into the desert to live out there. These people are typically referred to as the Desert Fathers, is what people call them today. Um, What that was, it was this group of Christian ascetics and hermits who lived out in the desert of what is now modern-day Egypt, is what they went out into. And you see, their whole goal in going out there, they would say, was simply to pursue God as wholeheartedly as possible. And so they were known for being kind of an austere people. In particular, they dedicated themselves to this very simple form of living, this very intentional approach to prayer, and what they referred to as, quote, doing battle with the devil. That's what they referred to it as, which I think sounds kind of awesome, in my opinion. Uh, but no, they really just wanted to be as close to Christ as possible, and they wanted to do whatever it took to get there. And you see, what they noticed out there in the desert is even though they very much loved Christ, and on top of that had essentially oriented their whole lives around him, nevertheless, it was a battle to stay awake to him. Still, the struggle was there, right? Even though their whole life was dedicated to it. Uh, So something that tells us is if it's a battle for you to stay awake to Jesus, just me apparently, but I'll be the only one, all right. Uh, That doesn't mean that you don't love Jesus. It's not what it means. Instead, what they said is if and when we become inattentive to God and asleep in the spiritual life, what's happening is there's a particular demon at work in that. I know like modern people tend to say that we don't believe in demons, which is very unfortunate because modern people definitely have their demons. Uh, We all have them, right? Uh, And this particular one that they said causes us to fall asleep, uh, what they called it was, quote, acedia, the demon of acedia. That's kind of a weird word. It's spelled, if you're wondering, it's spelled A-C-E-D-I-A. A-C-E-D-I-A, acedia. Will you say it with me? Acedia. Uh, And what it literally translates as as, or means, it means without care. That prefix a or a, uh, it almost always means without, and then cedia means care. So acedia is without care. Uh, Sometimes people today have actually changed the name because it's kind of a tricky word. They've changed it to sloth. So if you've seen like the seven deadly sins, right? One of them is sloth. Um, And yet acedia, I believe, is really the better name if only because a lot of people with acedia are actually way too busy. And they are not lazy at all, right? Uh, And you'll see why in a second. And so acedia just means, basic level, is without care. But meaning in particular, when it comes to what they would say is our greatest good and our highest happiness. Which is what? Uh, They would say participation in the life of God. Uh, that that's what God made us for. It's closeness to Christ, union with our maker, all the freedom and the fullness that comes from being in God's will, uh, that that's the highest happiness you and I could ever have. And yet the essence of acedia is you don't care about it. You don't care about it. Or maybe more accurately for someone who is a believer, somehow, some way, and this usually happens over time, you've stopped caring. 
It's not a priority, much less is, is it a passion. And perhaps in your mind, it's not even a possibility anymore. As part of that, you kind of see like the parts that work into acedia. Uh, typically, prayer becomes kind of difficult and dry for you. Scripture seems to become tedious and boring. Uh, worship seems like a waste of time. And God seems distant, if not unreachable. It is acedia. It's what it looks like on the outside. Uh, and like most Christians who are honest, the Desert Fathers said this would happen to them on a regular basis. Where they became very dry. And in particular for them, it was almost always happened at a very specific time of day. They always said it happened in the middle of the day. Uh, so not early in the day. Prayer was still very fresh then. The morning is usually filled with hope and purpose and excitement, right? Uh, neither was it at the end of the day. Per perseverance had had its effect by them. And there was some rest instead of the restlessness. Uh, but instead, right in the middle, everything about the goodness of God and the glory of his name seemed to just disappear on them. And all of it seemed pointless and tedious and boring. Uh, and so they called Asidia, the name they gave it was the Noonday Devil, is what they called it. And that's straight, it's a reference actually from Psalm 91, uh, where it says there's a destruction that wastes at noonday. And it's never really clear what that destruction is, so they just take it at liberty. It's Asidia, is what they said. Uh, that's because the experience of the de desert, fa desert Fathers is it was noonday to three o'clock, generally speaking, is when Asidia would set in. And here's the, here's the thing, the temptation that would hit them in the midst of that, like that discouragement right, or dryness, the temptation that would hit, hit them in that, which is going to be the same temptation for us whenever we feel kind of dry in our faith, uh, what they were always tempted to do was to flee their cell. Uh, they lived in these little monastic cells out in the desert, uh, and so the temptation was always to leave that and look for something else. And whereas you and I might think we don't have a cell to flee, all right, so like this does not apply to us. We do not have a monastic cell that we live in. Uh, but no, back then, the way they viewed their monastic cell is it was highly symbolic. Uh, that it was representative of something else, and in particular, what it represents is the narrow confines of the present moment. You're standing at the sink with a mound of dishes to do. You've got three kids right now, a lot of bottles. That's your cell. It's the narrow confines of the present moment. You're married. You're committed to a single person for the rest of your life. That's your cell. That's the narrow confines of the present moment. Maybe just more generally speaking, you live in a particular town and you do a particular job and you have a particular routine and set of circumstances that you go through almost every day. They would say that constitutes your cell. And what is the temptation when you're under the, uh, the sway of acedia? Meaning when the presence and purpose of God seem distant and dry to you, the temptation is to flee yourself. And there are two, different, two main different ways to flee, and I want to touch on both of them, uh, that they would point out, these desert fathers. Uh, one is what they called instability. That's what they called it. And what they meant by that is kind of a more literal form of fleeing, uh, meaning you just change your circumstances over and over and over again, and so you never stay put for very long. Uh, I remember in seminary, one of the things we learned about is what's called the life cycle of a pastor. Some of you have had like parents or grandparents who are pastors. It'd be interesting to see if this happened to them. Uh, if you Google it, the life cycle of a pastor, it'll come up. It's one of your first hits. Uh, what it is, it's whenever a pastor is called to a church, there's almost always a particular life cycle, or you could say a pattern um, that that call is going to follow. Have I mentioned this before? In my class I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what it is, the first few years, there's what they call the honeymoon phase. Uh, that's when almost everyone thinks, oh my goodness, this new pastor is amazing. Or like halfway decent. We'll go there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the pastor himself thinks, oh my goodness, this church is amazing, Right? Uh, and so honeymoon phase, everything is great. Uh, that lasts typically two to three years is what they say. I'm three and a half right now. We'll just don't read too much into that. Uh, 
Uh, but no, then there's another phase. We're, we're going to skip over the middle one right now. There's another phase much later on. It's between, it starts usually around like year 8, 9, 10, all the way up to year 20, uh, where if, if the call lasts that long, it's not a given, uh, but there's typically a phase of stability and growth. That's what they call it, stability and growth, after you've kind of persevered. Uh, and yet in between those two phases, uh, phases that is, in other words, the middle of the day, of a pastor's call. Uh, there's something that's typically called the disillusionment phase, is what they call it. Uh, and it's just like it sounds. There's kind of a disappointment or a discouragement that sets in. Usually underneath that, there's some sort of difficulty that's going on in the call. And you see the temptation of almost every pastor in the midst of that is to what? It's to flee. To flee the cell. I'm not going anywhere, by the way. You're stuck <laughs> with me. Um, that's because you're the perfect church. And clearly, I am the perfect pastor. Right? <laughs> uh, perpetual honeymoon phase, right? Uh, but no, instability is whenever the honeymoon ends and the noonday devil sets in, you just leave. You literally and physically bolt. It happens in a lot of pastoral calls. In fact, the average length of a senior pastor call, I was looking it up this past week, how long do you think it is? It's four years. Four years. The noonday devil it creeps in and you flee yourself. Notably, the studies all show there is a parallel phenomenon in marriage. The seven-year itch is what they call it. And I was looking it up just recently. The vast majority of marriages deteriorate in satisfaction between the five and ten-year mark. And a whole host of divorces do in fact happen right around year seven, year eight. The noonday devil. It creeps in and you flee yourself. It's the same with a lot of jobs or career paths. It's the same with a lot of people's membership at churches. It's the same with pretty much anything important and worthwhile in this life. That at some point, acedia begins to creep in. Uh, not right at the beginning usually, nor after many, many years, but in between the two. That noonday devil. And again, the temptation is you flee. You flee yourself. You leave your church. You end your marriage. You quit your job. You move cities. You get a new house. Whatever it takes, right? New circumstances. That will be your greatest good and your highest happiness. Growing up, I used to have a poster on my wall. It was like a cowboy riding off into the sunset, and it said, wherever you go, there you are. I had no idea what it meant as a little kid. That's weird. Um, but then I noticed, as I grew up, wherever I go, there I am. Right? The circumstances do not save you. They're not your greatest good. They're not your highest happiness. There's something else that God has for us, right? And so that's one form of fleeing, instability, where you literally just leave. The other kind of fleeing is what they called diversion, is the language they used kind of throughout the church. Uh, what they meant by that is somewhat akin to what you and I mean by the word distraction, meaning this is going to be a form of fleeing in which your body is still there. You haven't gone anywhere, uh, but your mind is elsewhere, perhaps right now. Yeah, right. Now, in other words, you're still phys physically present in wherever you are, it's just you're not truly present in any way that is actually material or important uh, is diversion. Uh, the Desert Fathers would have been aghast at how uncritically so many Christians have adopted the iPhone. You see, because constant connectivity is probably one of the easiest ways to not be present to the moment in front of you. It's a way to flee your cell with actually looking like you're still there. And therefore, it's one of the surest signs that we have fallen asleep to God. And so what is the demon that's instability or diversion, or the two ways of fleeing? What's the demon of ascetia again? It's to stop caring about the things of God. Uh, it's to no longer be present to one's real life. It's to flee oneself, and in doing so, to fall asleep to the presence of God. Who... Here's the thing about this. This is worth noting. 
Uh, God is near to us. You, like, we hear this passage, like it's very near. Jesus is very near to you. Uh, but he's near to you not in some imaginary future, nor in some bygone past, nor through some portal into a digital realm. Now, where is he near to us? The monk said, in your cell. In the present moment, that you and I are always trying to flee, is where God is. And so how do we know whether we're asleep? You just ask, have I fled my cell? Have I fled my cell? Are you always chasing something else? Never really staying put, constantly connected, ceaselessly busy, distracting and diverting your attention to anything and everything except God and to the present moment. And so next week we'll look at, that's falling asleep, next week we're going to look at how to wake up to the presence of God, some practices that will help with that. I hope I didn't, it doesn't feel like I hung you out to dry, like, oh, now, how, now we all know we're asleep and got to wait till next week to wake up. <laughs> uh, if I can offer something that I think is like a little bit helpful on that front, um, just being aware of how you fall asleep and you can say no to it, what the church fathers would say is joyful perseverance in your cell. Right? Just stay put. Um, but if I can mention something else, if you're part of the class that we just had over in the, uh, in the cafe, it was called Discerning the Will of God. We are studying Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, and Ignatius of Loyola may be his most helpful teaching. He distinguishes between uh, two sorts of experiences, you could say, in the spiritual life. Uh, and one is what he calls consolation, is what he calls it. Um, what he means by that is there are, in fact, these times in the walk of faith where we feel close to God. Right? You feel close to God in consolation. And so when that's the case, there's going to be what Ignatius calls spiritual joy. Now, it feels very good to be cons- uh, in a state of consolation. And so things like hope and love and obedience to the will of God, all of that's going to come pretty easily when you're in a state of consolation. We see the other state that we experience, often through no fault of our own, by the way, these sort of things, they just kind of come and go. Uh, but the other one is what he calls desolation. And it's essentially the opposite of consolation. It's instead of close, you feel far from God in this moment. And perhaps getting farther, you feel yourself like drifting away from him. And not every time, but a lot of the times this happens when life has become hard in some way. And the result of that is things like joy and hope and love and all these things that we say are like the property of believing Christians, right? Um, They become very hard. Obedience to God in general just becomes very difficult. And so you have these two states, right? Consolation, desolation. Both are part of the experience of faith, by the way. One is not always the result of unbelief, just to be clear. You see, here's the thing about desolation in particular that Ignatius says. Uh, Whenever we are in it, first of all, that's not sinful in and of itself. Now, maybe it's sin that got us there in the first place, far from God that is, but it's not a sin to feel far from God. You see, where sin could creep in is where it ties in with acedia, because what acedia suggests to us is, you feel far from God right now? And it would suggest, don't care. Don't care about it. Meaning, just look elsewhere for your greatest good and your highest happiness. Look elsewhere. And so, in other words, when life gets hard and God feels far, again, you flee. Uh, You escape in whatever way you can. And yet, Ignatius, what he would say in terms of, like, how do you stay awake? Uh, He says, desolation, it's never the time to make a decision. No major decisions in a state of desolation. It's never the time to make a change. It's never the time to pull back from prayer. It's never the time to get lazy or lackadaisical in the spiritual life. Instead, what he says, instead of this don't care, he would say double down. You double down. Uh, You double down on prayer. You double down on self-examination. Maybe it is a sin that's causing it. You need to double down on self-examination. You need to double down on your commitments that you've made. In other words, stay in your current calling, fully present. See, because in your tribulation, what's worth knowing uh, is God has a higher happiness and a greater good for you than your own personal comfort and ease. 
Namely, like, what is that higher happiness, greater good? It's Christ who went through the great tribulation already. That's the cross, remember. He went through the great tribulation and he just stayed in his cell. Bore the burden, carried the cross so that when you and I go through our tribulation, this is the end times. You're going through tribulation. But when you and I go through it, we feel so far. But no, where is he? He's right there in the midst of that. At the very gates is what he says. When you see these things happening, he's right at the gates. And so whereas I don't know exactly what your tribulation looks like, my encouragement to you this morning is simple. Don't flee your cell. Double down. Carry your cross. Stay awake. Meaning, stop escaping. Because when you escape your cross, you lose out on your Christ. Let's pray as our worship team comes forward. Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who came to bear the great tribulation on our behalf. Uh, we are, in fact, living in the end times which almost always we take to be really bad news, um, but all that really means is that in a life that is falling apart often, uh, Christ himself is very near to us. And so God, fix our attention on that, not on the tribulation around us, but on the Jesus who is with us. Help us to do that intentionally this week uh, before we come back together next week. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.